Hi guys, welcome to Counterpoints, my name is Connor, and today we're going to be breaking down Undercity, a hammer and bolter entry into the realms of Sigmar. This will be set in a Warhammer fantasy timeline rather than the science fiction setting of Warhammer 40,000, so expect more muskets than LAS rifles. At Games Workshop's request, we are cutting out a healthy chunk of the episode, but still showing the most important plot points and violence. I will be pausing intermittently to break down lore and observations, so if you want to watch the original, please go to Warhammer TV, and if you're in a non-service country, use a VPN. This episode is brought to you by Mastermind Models and Miniatures and Libra Demonica. Mastermind Models and Minis is an insanely talented paint studio out of Huntsville, Alabama who do commissions, so if your pile of shame is weighing you down, be sure to check them out in the description below, and be sure to tell them that we sent you. Libra Demonica is an incredible Estonian-based third-party bits manufacturer who will absolutely take your models to the next level, so be sure to check them out as well. The episode begins with Handover Toll, a renowned witch hunter recruiting a disgruntled friend for a new mission. Armand Callus, a former soldier of the Free Guilds, is nursing his ale and resists the mission due to Hanover having worked with his ex-lover, a thief named Lissa. It's very Dungeons and Dragons, very buddy cop, and actually a really charming conversation. I really want to commend the voice actors and writers because in just a few lines we understand that Hanover Toll is an agent of the Order of Azur a highly regarded witch hunting organization similar to the Inquisition of Warhammer 40,000. We understand that he wields considerable power and competence and influence, and he views his job as more important than his personal relationships, but he is charming and cavalier enough to recruit who he needs to accomplish the mission. Armand relents and reluctantly agrees to help Hanover hunt down a scumbag human smuggler who may have sold a nobleman to Skaven Ratmen or to cannibal vampires. This was a shit plan, and it barely worked. We have him, don't we? <laughs> and a fat lot of good you two were. That armor heavy, is it? It's over, Rinsor. <laughs> Tell me where Lord Hockenvar is. Hanover Toll. <laughs> Hanover Toll. The great witch hunter isn't going to get his quarry this time. I don't have him. Well, not anymore. And you never game. Not now. Who has him, Renzo? Tell me now, and I'll ask the High Arbiter for leniency. You don't understand. You don't betray these people. That's worse than death. That's worse than... Well, he's dead. That was blood magic. This makes it harder now. We'll have to go down there. Mm, if this turns into some wading through shit crot hunt in the sewers, Toll, I swear to you. And we're going to need some help. Just promise me you'll keep a level head and a sheathed sword. We find ourselves in Hammerhall, a super city built around a realm gate between the realm of Akshi, the realm of fire, and Gyra, the realm of life. This is one of the major cities in the mortal realms because the fire magic of Akshi fuels industry and weapons manufacturing, while Gyra provides an endless bounty of food to support the burgeoning population. Not only that, but it is one of the largest realm gates, allowing entire armies to march through shoulder to shoulder to face whatever threat challenges the forces of order. Watching the foot chase through the medieval town gave me flashbacks to when I was a police officer because for all the fun and intrigue of chasing bad guys, the truth is that running in armor sucks. Armand actually reminds me of a former colleague of mine, Rice, who while perhaps not the most cunning of police investigators, was a former football player who could run down teenagers while wearing body armor and a duty belt. Pretty good times. There are tons of details I appreciate, like that Age of Sigmar setting is more Renaissance than medieval. 
While there are knights, horses, and royalty, there's also the beginning of modern technology in the muskets and well-manufactured armor. I like that this is effectively a buddy cop movie set in a renaissance era filled with magic and danger. I like that chasing down a thief and almost getting your head blown off by a musket pistol is just another day in Hammer Hall. This shows that for all the complaints of Age of Sigmar being too bright and commercial, there are plenty of grim dark corners of the realms to sink into. I like that the sewers are so insanely large, you know they flush the waste of a super city. I love that there is humor and playful banter while dealing with the dead, the muck, and the mire. This is absolutely reflective of reality, where law enforcement officers and investigators cope with the horrors of the job with dark humor. Well, he's dead. Hey guys, I found him. I'm actually going to kill you. No, oh, don't blame him, Armand. It's not his fault no one can navigate the Undercrofts like I can. It's a good thing we've got you, Finn. An expert in blame and faults, isn't it? Well, I'm also handy with a lockpick. We won't need a lockpick. At least not to get through the gate. He had a sewer key. I knew it would be sewers. <laughs> Hmm. Hammerstrike Gate. Just south of the Bridge of Comets. Fine. Quiet. You'd prefer a racket? I'd prefer something I can fight. I'd prefer to find for Lord Hawk and Varv and get out of this place. <laughs> oh, still afraid of the dark, are you, Armand? Something up ahead. Close. How can you tell? Green means Skaven. I thought the hammers had driven them out. Well, that's the thing about rats. They always come back. What drives someone, even scum like Renza, to trade humans to the Skaven? And why a princely? They're easier victims. What do they want them for anyway? Nothing good.
Those soldiers gave their lives, Toll. This had better be worth it. I agree. The promised purse is looking a little light. <sighs> Everything has a price with you, Lissa. <laughs> Says the mercenary. Enough! I'm thinking. For Skaven to act so, they weren't coming for us. They were afraid. Terrified. Get to the point. I was wrong. He said people. Rensor said people, not things. Not rat men. People. How could I have been so stupid? The missing citizens, the fact there are no bodies. How could I have been so blind to the truth? Tom. You said it. You set it up there on the bridge. And I didn't listen. Rensor's ring. Blood magic. I know what's got Lord Hockenvar. It's not Skaven. It's much worse. The Hammers of Sigmar, who drove out the Skaven, are the poster boys of the Stormcast, the same way that the Ultramarines are the poster boys of Warhammer 40,000. They are charged with the protection of Hammerhall, and as the longest serving storm host, they have become the most alien to the population they protect. When a Stormcast is killed in battle, they flash up to the realm of Azur to be reforged. Each time a part of their soul is chipped away, they come back with less memory, personality, and mortal morality. As they lose their humanity, their sympathy to the short-lived mortals they are charged with protecting wanes, and they become simple weapons with simple codes, slaughtering any who defy their god Sigmar. While the cities of Sigmar may fear their protectors, they desperately need them, and the Skaven are the perfect enemy to demonstrate that need. Skaven are ratmen mutants, mythologized to have originated by tricking a city into dedicating one of the greatest temples ever built to their god, the Horned Rat. Using ethereal magic, they are able to burrow between the realms in great tunnel systems similar to the webway of the Eldari in Warhammer 40,000. In this tunnel system are innumerable Skaven, perhaps billions or even trillions. The only thing keeping them from conquering the mortal realms is their own conniving, jealous, and disloyal nature, and the fact that the tunnel systems they create are wildly unstable, collapsing and killing ratmen as often as they deliver them to the mortal realms themselves. Clans of Skaven have dedicated themselves to different aspects of their god. Some like using pestilence, others technology, and others raw aggression and numbers. The same way they are ignored and despised within the realms is a very dangerous but disgusting nuisance, an unending horde of vicious teeth, claws, and weapons, the Horned Rat has achieved apotheosis on par with the Chaos Gods and yet is ignored in the great game of Souls. There are even more great details here, like Armand screaming out Vermintide, a deadly stampede of Skaven, and an excellent Horde Slasher video game. Hanover Tull shows he is prepared for anything, chucking a grenade of poison into the midst of rats, and another detail, intentional or not, is the blood oozing from the rats' ears and eyes. Real-world rat poison are anticoagulants, meaning that they disrupt the body's ability to clot, and as a result, blood simply oozes out of internal organs, causing the rat to become anemic and ultimately die. While in the real world this can take days, it's clear in the realm of magic, rat poison is instantaneous and enchanted to be less harmful to humans. The halberd and blunderbuss are great weapons against the teeming horde, but they are simply not enough to keep our bodyguards alive, and they pay in blood to keep our protagonists going. While I know it is often a complaint that Games Workshop has gone woke by constantly and prominently featuring women and minority protagonists, I'm happy to note that they are as vulnerable to the grim dark threats of the universe and seem to have no more plot armor than the rest of our merry band of heroes. So blights, Sigma damned vampires. Um, I'm more concerned about those. Where do you think you're going? Ooh. Ooh, to pick a lock. Got to save you, damsel, somehow. <laughs> Oh, 
The deadbolt won't shift. Open it. Please. Do you always fumble your hook under pressure, Lissa? <sighs> Remind me to show you how to do that sometime. I nearly had it. I'm in a hurry. It's him. Are you hurt?
gods. All for nothing. We need to take this to the Order. We have nothing to... Nothing you could have done, Armand. He was dead before we even got there. They all were. We foiled their immediate plans anyway. I'm sorry about Lissa, old friend. She ran. Again. She found us a way out. Save your life. I know. Though I had hoped... First did I. I was thinking, wasn't I? In that bar. Into the mire again. You pulled me out. No. I wouldn't say so. He was sunk already, not <laughs> sinking. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> Let's go. Soul Blights are vampires who combine their souls with the ravenous dead in order to achieve immortality. Either created through drinking an elixir of necromancers or through the bite of their kin, they can infiltrate human populations either through mass slaughter and mindless hunting or by recruiting nobles of the realms with promises of immortality. Once infected, new formed vampires find they have a ravenous hunger for the flesh and blood of the living that is only temporarily satisfied through slaughter. The vampires encountered in this skirmish are likely Vargeists, once noble vampires who have given in to their hunger and become warped by it. As undead themselves, powerful soul blights are able to control armies of dead souls and grant them either zombified staggering animation or return parts of their noble souls. I think the bravery of Armand has to be commended as he calls out to protect Lyssa, chooses to save his friend from the Horde, tries to save the nobleman, and takes the time to burn the written plans of the enemy while a host of undead are hot on his heels. Likewise, I think it's of note that Hanover Toll orders Armand to protect Lyssa over himself, puts the mission before his own survival, and has prepared even more of his inventory to kill vampires by using light grenades. Lyssa, while fleeing before the fight is done, is indispensable in her use of death magic to unlock the lair and in saving Armand's life. It is only once she sees that the nobleman is dead, that there is no money to be made, and all that awaits her is death before she quits the field. It shows us that she still loves and wants to protect Armand and to a lesser degree Hanover, but she is ultimately a self-interested character who will not unnecessarily risk her life without compensation. The final scene between Hanover and Armand hit me like a brick. Armand admits to Hanover that he was sinking into depression and likely post-traumatic stress disorder before Hanover pulled him for this mission. Beautifully, Hanover's response is to roast him and to say that he wasn't sinking, he was already sunk, kicking his friend while he was down, something you can only do with someone you love fraternally. While this is a cartoon set in a fantasy universe made for nerds, it describes a very real dynamic for military and first responders. When you're young and you do exciting things, you can cut your teeth on that excitement and it can become addictive. However, after a few bad calls, a few dead bodies, and a few lost friends, the job can become psychologically caustic to you. You're afraid of your own shadow, you're afraid of your own mistakes, and you don't want to take any more risks because you know that your luck will eventually run out. This can make you worse at your job, and it can also make you want to quit entirely. That being said, there is a fresh excitement and purpose in doing military and first response work, and so chasing the high of new missions and calls can help temporarily relieve your self-doubt, pity, depression, and anxiety because you are again filled with purpose, and the work is so engaging you can forget about your old wounds for a bit. Armand is obviously scarred by the job, but still has plenty of bravery and skill left to offer the world. And Hanover is a true hero, chasing the enemies of order into his old age, regardless of his likely grisly fate. I love Hanover as an archetype of the persistent hero, and I love Armand as the archetype of the reluctant hero. They both speak to real personalities I am honored to have served with in the Marine Corps and law enforcement. Hanover and Armand are enjoying some fraternal post-mission beers when they are recruited by a Stormcast leader to continue the investigation as it runs deeper than previously thought. As I mentioned in the introduction, Games Workshop has politely, if forcefully requested that we do not use the entirety of the episodes in our reviews and breakdowns. I view it as my job to cut out 30-40% to 40 of the content, so you have an incentive to go check out the original, but to leave enough meat and bones of the episode, particularly the gritty and satisfying violence, while filling in the gaps with informative and compelling lore. I genuinely do love creating this content, and it forces me to expand my knowledge of the universe and not just rely on my passion. So if you like my breakdowns, like, share, and subscribe, and ring the bell so you can see whenever new content drops. 
comment down below and feel free to fight it out in the comment section over lore and narrative interpretations. If you can't think of anything to say, then type in comment for the comment gods. I will salute you in real life with an Aquila, which I can only halfway do right now because I'm holding the baby, but I will reply with an 07 in the comment section saluting you for your service. Become a YouTube or Patreon member to help support the channel or check out our sponsors. I appreciate you. I'll catch you in the next one. Until the end. Special thanks to Vokes, Butters, Drazar, Lucifer the Doberman, Stephanie Luminous, Ken, Female Escort IRL, Tango Hotel, Mitchell Johnson, Sir Liamson, John, Poofy, Leo Whitmer, Froggy Style, Adrian, Azriel, Cole G, Grassroots Hegemon, Christian Valeris, Name, Sir Fortesque, M. Penner, Weekend Jail, Exart Logan, and Jamaloo.